Life Audio. You're listening to Therapy and Theology, and I'm your host, Carly McClear. This podcast is a space where we explore popular topics and questions related to the convergence of faith, feelings, spiritual formation, and more. My prayer is that through these conversations, we will grow in our awareness of who we are as beloved children of God, learn to acknowledge our needs and emotions with curiosity and compassion, and rediscover the purpose and power of our unique stories through the lens of the gospel. As a licensed therapist and ministry leader, I want to give voice to the many questions we face while cultivating a clearer view of how our faith informs our healing journey. I don't have all the answers, but I am committed to going deeper and walking together. So whether you've been to therapy or know exactly what you believe when it comes to theology, I want to invite you to join this journey as we fearlessly name the complexities of our present reality and press into the hope of the gospel story. So are you ready? Let's jump into today's question and begin this journey together. Christians should be serious about our faith, but does that mean we need to be serious people all the time, especially in a world of weird, absurd stuff, and even when Christian culture gets crazy? I'm Barnabas Piper of the Happy Ramp Podcast, where we cheerfully rant about pop culture, church culture, work, creativity, life, and just about everything, but we take Jesus seriously. Listen and subscribe at lifeaudio.com. Attention, your withdrawal has been denied by the U.S. government. Picture a world where your every purchase is monitored, tracked, and controlled by those in power to suppress the freedoms of those they see fit. Hi, my name is Jason Hansen. I'm a former CIA officer and New York Times bestselling author. And right now, I've become very focused on the impending rollout of the central bank digital currency. This is not a work of fiction. It's a terrifying reality looming on the horizon. But there is a bit of good news. I've partnered with Advantage Gold to offer you a solution. They are specialists in converting your traditional assets, like those inside an IRA or 401k, into tangible assets such as physical gold and silver. Don't allow your money to be controlled. Claim your free gold protection kit from Advantage Gold. Call 800-900-8000. That's 800-900-8000. Hey guys, welcome back to Therapy and Theology. I'm excited to be diving into another episode of this next season. But if you haven't listened to the first episode of the new season, I really encourage you to go back and check that out for more context on our season theme, Embodied, and what that means and how we're going to be using that to explore a connectedness between our faith, feelings, and spiritual formation. But today, I'm going to dive into part one of a three-part series on the story of our bodies. Now, I imagine that there are many different responses to thinking about the story your body holds. And in many ways, I do believe that it can instantly bring up wounds and shame and fear. Yet, this tells us something, doesn't it? I remember the first time I heard this language, and I instantly thought of all of the things that my body has carried, and most of those things being negative. But as we return to the story of our bodies and all that it's carried over the years, we are invited into a journey to process the past and reclaim the goodness God intended for us to bring into this world. So on that note, I was thinking about this recently as I was writing this episode. And ironically, I've been having a lot of conversations about the body and the demographic of people that I feel are most comfortable sharing the story of their bodies are the elderly population. And so I live in a little downtown area in my city and I go to the Y um, and I'm very much an early riser. And so I go in the mornings and oftentimes that's when a lot of the older folks are also there. And so I have so many sweet friendships with uh, men and women who are so many generations above me. And it's been such a gift because as I get to share in their stories, what automatically and so naturally comes up is the story their bodies are carrying. And so I have noticed an interesting pattern of narrative that surrounds their body's journey through aging, unhealth, and restoration and healing. 
And in some ways, I have found these conversations both heartbreaking to hear about the challenges and the difficulties through cancer diagnoses and heart surgeries, yet there is something really powerfully cathartic about processing the experience of such physical experiences that I am often captured by in these conversations and honored to be told. The wisdom, vulnerability, and authenticity of these stories always amazes me. And the other day, I really had a great moment with a gentleman who was on the exercise bike next to me, and I was trying to help him with his seat because it was hurting his knee. And he shared for several minutes with me just all of the things he has overcome and all of the, the battles his body has gone through. And this has brought me to try and answer my own story, collecting the memories of how my body has grown strong, overcome challenges, disease, and learned deep lessons of shame and overwhelming grace. And as a believer, I find that many of us have learned to begin our stories with the broken parts of us. We live in a disembodied world. And in such a state, it is easy to recall the body's accounts of fear, shame, pain, anger, etc. Kristen Chen from the Al Anderson Center podcast recently spoke on this exact same topic. And she said this, for many, Christians begin their story with the fall. At the beginning of the story is creation. And so this is where I would like us to start as we begin to share in the process of understanding our stories. We need to return to the beginning, the origin of our body as very good, blessed and designed to reflect our creator so that we can have a clear vision and reminder as we process the pain that has evaded since the fall. So if you've grown up in Christian culture, I wonder for a lot of us if we have not had much affirming language for our bodies. You know, I think this has a lot to do with shame and guilt and the sin language we hold around our sexuality and our physical desires. And sexualization, I think, alone has caused immense disembodiment, which we will all cover in the next episode as the impact of sin and the shattering of trauma. Yeah, when I look to scripture and I, I just ruminate on the profound concepts found within the entirety of, of the Bible narrative, I can't help but celebrate the body, which I believe can help recover a powerful new perspective of our stories as we begin to explore what has been experienced and held within and carried within our bodies. So today I want to anchor our time in three important truths which have helped me develop a grounded sense of embodiment from a biblical perspective. And beginning here has helped me withstand stories of shame and anger and exile and loss and fear my body has had to encounter along the way. And I hope that it can do the same for you. So let's talk about these three concepts. First, I want to talk about being made in the image of God or the theology of the Imago Dei, which is Latin for image of God. And this is found in Genesis 1, 27 and 28, where it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them, and God blessed them. This concept of being made in the image of God is an essential part of our identity as both believers and as human beings. Scholars define this aspect of human personhood as one that denotes the symbolic relationship between God and humanity. So this image bearingness is defined in that God's likeness is actualized in humanity. The term Imago Dei refers most fundamentally to two things. First, God's own self-actualization through humankind. And second, God's care for humankind. Thus, we and our bodies mirror God's divinity. That is so profound to think about. And in addition to this, I think it also gives us a foundation for value and worth of humanity and of our lives in general, based not on anything we do outside of that, but just by being an image and reflection of God himself. Authors of The Reciprocating Self, one of my favorite texts, if you want to explore the development of self, they talk about the theology of the Imago Dei by pointing to three fundamental values. 
So let's talk about them really quickly. One, uniqueness. So here are our values for our identity. Uniqueness. Our humanity mirrors God's uniqueness in the Trinity. This is such a powerful exploration of our state of being and our personalities and how we differentiate from one another, just as God, the Son, and the Spirit differentiate from each other. Our bodies hold this uniqueness externally, yes, but even more so internally as an expression of thought, personality, and feeling. But this uniqueness does not challenge or take away from our relational aspect of mirroring God's image. Think about it. Our uniqueness cannot be valid or valued without being in relationship with another, namely God or others, right? We see this, how we are seen as unique or experience our uniqueness. And I would then say are called to value our uniqueness and the uniqueness of others by being in relationship with one another. We see this beautifully in chapter one of the Gospel of John, where it talks about this relationship with God and the Spirit and the Father working in relationship with one another while maintaining distinction from one another. The reciprocating self-authors put it this way, it is in relationship with God and others we come to value our uniqueness. In a sense, another provides an orientation for the self to be made known. So in addition to both our uniqueness and our relationality that we are to mirror as God's image bearers, finally, we see the value of reciprocity. This is just the meaning of moving towards one another in mutual giving for the mutual benefit. We see this so much in the relationship between God and Jesus, his son. I love John chapter 17. If you have a moment to go back and read that beautiful prayer of Jesus, and how he's talking about the unity he has with the Father, and how he just desires for his disciples and the children of God to also understand and have unity with God, just as he has unity with God. And it says this in verses 1 through 4, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all things to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorify you on earth and have accomplished the work that you gave to me. And now, Father, glorify me. There's a mutuality in your own presence with the glory that I have had with you before the existence of the world. This unity and uniqueness and reciprocity is at the heart of the triune God. This is what the reciprocal self is talks about the our bodies bear the stamp of sacredness as we in our humanity bear witness to God's image. So therefore our abilities, our intellect, our character, our human bodies, their shape and their size all reflect and represent our creator. Hello, my name is Adam Comer. And I'm Ryan Chittister. And we're the host of Life After Addiction Podcast. If you or someone you love struggles with addiction, check us out, Life After Addiction Podcast, and you can subscribe at lifeaudio.com. I can't believe BJ's Wholesale Club has all this great new stuff. Honey, this sofa is so stylish. Yeah, stylish. And this sweater is so on trend. Try it on. That's me, Mr. Trendy. And BJ's has the hottest brands at great prices, like Sur La Table and Nespresso. And Hot Wheels. <laughs> It's Barbie! Hi, Ken. Let's go to the beach in my Corvette. Attention, BJ's members. The club is now closed. Just five more minutes? Please. Saving club or on BJ's.com. Not a member? Join today. BJ's. Absurdly simple savings. Thus, when we interact with others around us, we're looking into the face of God and reflecting in each and every human being. This can change the way we see others, whether they are believers or non-believers, whether they agree with our exact stance on things or not. What a beautiful way in order to see ourselves and others reflected in this unity and uniqueness and reciprocity. There is this 
concept called the Quasimodo complex. And in his book, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made, Dr. Paul Brand Philip Yancey explains the powerful aspect we have in bearing and witnessing to the image of God within relationships. He tells a story about one study that was done on prison inmates seeking to reveal the reverse links of emotional conflict that may produce physical illness. The hypothesis was that physical deformities can impact emotional distress and then lead to crime. Interestingly enough, 60% of the 11,000 inmates had minor or significant physical deformities. Had these criminals been impacted by their deformities, rejected by society, and thus leading to a life of crime and violence? He says this, regardless of choice, human beings form self-image based largely on the image another mirrors back to them. This is both an invitation, I believe, and such a beautiful picture of how we are to look to God to see our image bearingness, to see our belovedness and our value to him, and then also to be able to reflect that in relationship with others. What if, instead of judgment and labeling by the external presentation of one's physical form or their behaviors, we look deeper to the God in them to see God's image on their life as beloved and valued and accepted. Another significant aspect of bearing God's image is the ruling we are given by co-creating with God. We are creative beings because we are given imageness and likeness to our creative God. Yet, as we'll discuss in deeper context in our next episode, our co-creating has been shattered and is being restored by the image of God found in the life of Jesus, who came as a body to earth to lead us back to the beauty that we were created to reflect. So in addition to this incredible incredibly large amount of theology on our image bearingness. We also have temple language. And this is another foundation for our value of our bodies. I don't know if you've recognized this, but in addition to just our understanding of a divine nature, being image bearers, we also have been given language throughout the New Testament about being temples of God. Now, I will note that this language has been used as weapons to shame the behavior of the body, yet that was not the intent, nor do I think it dismisses the imagery of what has been carried out throughout Christian history. If we think about the narrative of the Bible, we see Eden was technically the first temple, so to speak, right? When we think of the temple in this particular context, We're seeing it as the place where God resides, right? His presence is there. Yet we see after the fall and the exile from Eden, God's presence was separated from his children because of brokenness. And the physical temple was then constructed to bridge the gap between God and his people. We see this referenced in 1 Kings 6. What we find, though, throughout this narrative is that the temple built by human hands was easily destroyed. Right? The people of God repeatedly make choices to f- define good and evil apart from God, and they're taken over. During the Babylonian captivity, the temple is destroyed, and God's people are displaced from Jerusalem. Then we read about the rebuilding of the temple, God recall- calling his people home and to return to him, and that he would be in their midst, this beautiful reunion of God's love for his people and his covenant relationship with them. The process of rebuilding the physical temple begins in Ezra chapters 5 and 6. Yet, due to living under the kings and rulers of the exiles, there's a lot of disappointment and disillusionment and opposition that comes with rebuilding the temple. Other references of this are in the book of Haggai and Zechariah. Yet, these prophecies of the Old Testament speak to a greater temple, one not built of stone. Jesus is said to be the stone the builders rejected in Psalm 118. He speaks to himself as the temple, unified with the Father, and finally talks about being destroyed and rebuilt in his resurrection as an everlasting temple and unity with God and his children. This is how we now 
are God's temple through Christ. Our bodies hold now the presence of God as we originally were designed in the garden. This is why the resurrection of Jesus is so significant to our practice as believers and the unity of our bodies with God is that it renews this idea that we can house the spirit of God, the presence of God right in our broken bodies. It's this coexistence of two very distinct and contrasting images of a body that's human and and very much broken and moving towards death, yet alive in Christ as a new creation, something that can house the presence of God and is being renewed daily. And so we see all these passages within the New Testament. I could read you so many, but First Peter 2 is something that is so beautiful. And in verse 8, he talks about who we are as temples of God, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The language of 1 Corinthians 3 is also so beautiful. He asks a beautiful question. Paul says, do you know that your body is a temple and that the spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defies the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. This is such imagery for how much God values, one, our lives, two, our bodies, as being housing of his spirit. One of the things that I think can be so powerful about this also is that it relates to our relationality and our uniqueness as people. We read in Ephesians 2 about how this unity of Jesus, this resurrection of Jesus that allows us all to partake in in God's divine nature divides the wall of hostility, right? And that, that the cross allows us to bridge the gap between all of the different barriers that come up against us. And so in verse 19, it says this, consequently, you are no longer foreigners or strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people also members of his household built on the foundation of apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and raised to become a holy temple in God. And in him, you are to be built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. This is powerful language to hold on to as we see our bodies earthly bruised and broken, we also are reminded that our bodies are being renewed daily and are to house the presence of God. And this leads to our final element of embodied theology. What does it mean to have the indwelling of God's spirit in us? This is a lot of theology here, but what I think can be really powerful about just dipping our toes in is the message that Jesus leaves his disciples is one of empowerment for us today too. It is the spirit of God in us. And this spiritual power is one of God's many gifts and inheritance of being a child of God. And it allows us to attune to the movements within us. This is where we have to go back to the body and recognize that if the spirit of God is truly in me, if the spirit of God is truly in you, then maybe we don't have to point fingers and become frustrated and angry. But what if we created space for attunement to be able to trust that the Holy Spirit is going to do work in each of us and to be able to cultivate that decisiveness and that decision within our relationships? We may be familiar with passages like the fruit of the Spirit or the gifts of the Spirit, yet these movements of the Spirit are not just mere words or action items or doings that we have to live up to. But what if instead of thinking of the actions of the Spirit as something that we have to live up to, we saw it as invitations of the Spirit to reveal to us. I was talking recently about this very thing with one of my clients, and she asked a powerful question about trauma and the experience of distress and then fruit of the Spirit and being really discouraged that the fruit of the Spirit was not in her. Um, because of the way she was responding. And I I sat with that for a while, and we both talked about the importance of how 
what if in these moments where we're having difficulty, where we are experiencing maybe an unkind thought or feeling, or we are jealous or insecure, or developing anger or bitterness, these are moments, right, when we're aware of those things that we invite the Spirit in to be that kindness, first to us, to our own woundedness, and then to those around us, right? It's, it's an invitation to allow the Spirit to do work in us. And this is not just a simple thing, but I think it's a thing that takes time, this healing process, this restoring to the newness of what we were created for is something that happens over time and is a slow process, but a beautiful one. And so as we just hold space for this idea of the spirit-led life, there are so many passages that I would encourage you to look at and just think about what is the spirit doing in me and how do I connect with the spirit? I think of 1 John 4 and how it says, no one has ever seen God, but if you love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. And we know that we live in him and he is in us because he has given us his spirit. And this is what we can hold on to, right? We also see in 1 Corinthians 6 where it says that we are temples of the Holy Spirit within us. And this is something that can be comforting to us, not so much convicting or shaming, but as a source of empowerment, of help, of support, right? We read throughout scripture that the Spirit is a guide, a comforter, an advocate with the Father on this journey of life. And so with these three foundational aspects of the theology of our bodies from a Christian perspective, I pray we can take time to reflect on how these truths can ground us as we continue to explore the shattering stories of our body in the next episode. So here are some quick questions that maybe you could take to reflect on this week as we hold space for the beauty that God has created us in as his image bears unique and in unity and relationship and reciprocity with God and others as both temples that house God's presence that we are never to be disconnected from again. And then also to have the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in us. These are beautiful things. And, but it might feel a little uncomfortable. Maybe these aren't the ways that you viewed your body before. And so here are some questions that you can take into the rest of this week. One, what makes you unique from those around you? What if we just took some time to think about, like, what are my unique qualities? How do I see and value my uniqueness within my relationship with others in my life? What are the ways I seek to be unified and in relationship with others? Who are, who are my relationships, right? What are the ways in which I can become more reciprocal in my relationships? Like giving mutually to one another. Maybe it's going to a friend and, and saying, hey, I want, to, I want to have a deeper relationship with you. What does that look like? How can we meet each other in that space? And then how does temple language serve as an affirmation for you? What does it look like to know that God is present with you and that his presence goes with you wherever you go? Oftentimes our image of God and God's presence and God's nearness can be based on our doings or based on our goodness or badness. And so in this space, we're just saying, what if God's presence is with you no matter what? And it's holding space for that loving and kindness and that movement of compassion and comfort. And in addition to that, looking into the indwelling of the spirit, God's spirit in you, what does that feel like? How do we even maybe process that? What have we maybe seen the spirit to be in our lives? And maybe what could it look like to see the Spirit as more of a guide, as an invitation to say, come Holy Spirit, reveal to me, be close to me, show me, right? How might you today, this week, attune to the Spirit and allow it to be a resource and more awareness for your body? So I pray that this week we will go holding this groundedness of our goodness in God's image bearingness his uniqueness, holding his presence and mirroring to the world the love and kindness he created us for. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of Therapy and Theology. If you have a question or topic you would like discussed on a future episode, please feel free to email me or drop it in the comments. Also, don't forget to subscribe to have each week's episode instantly downloaded to your podcasts. 
and see the show notes for resources mentioned in this episode. To access more content and join my monthly email list for the latest updates and info, visit my website at carlymarkleer.com. Are you struggling to lose weight and keep it off? Tired of wasting time and money on starvation diets that lead to more frustration and stress? If there was a weight loss solution that could actually work for you, would you try it? Then head to golo.com. I'm Steve. I lost 138 pounds in nine months on Golo. I'm Amber. I've lost 128 pounds with Golo. If you're ready to take back control of your life, head to golo.com now and see how Golo can work for you. That's golo.com. My sleep is way better. My inflammation has gone way down. Golo saved my life. I was way overweight. That's what sent me down the path. I wanted to make sure and live for my kid. I have literally tried everything. I was on the verge of getting gastric bypass surgery, and I saw the Golo commercial, and it was the last thing I tried because it worked. Join over 2 million people who found a better way to lose weight with Golo. Your healthier and happier life begins at Golo.com. That's G-O-L-O.com. Again, G-O-L-O.com.